Um, so good morning, everyone. So my name is uh, Pascal Chavis, and I work at the Mediterranean Institute of Neurobiology in Marseille. And um, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this uh, first session of the symposium entitled Neural Network Architecture. So the first presentation uh, will be by Christophe Le Terrier. So Christophe is the head of the Neurocytolab at the Institute of Neurophysiopathology in Marseille. And uh, today he will talk about the axonal cytoskeleton at the nanoscale. So Christophe, the stage is yours now. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for uh, giving me the opportunity uh, to talk to you today and to present you uh, uh, with the research we do uh, here in Marseille. So uh, hopefully everyone hears me, everyone sees the presentation. Uh, if not, you have to scream or do something uh, visually. Uh, so we are studying the axonal cytoskeleton and we are trying to uh, get to the nanoscale of its organization. This is a neuron, and as you all know, uh, neurons have two main compartments, the dendrite and cell body, the somatodendritic compartment, and the axon. This uh, structural compartmentation reflects and, uh, and underlies uh, the organization uh, at the functional level with the inputs that are on the dendrite and cell body and the outputs uh, where the action potential is generated at the initial segment of the axon and then propagates along the axon to downstream cells. What is interesting uh, for us is that the axon itself is compartmented. So you have, for example, the axon initial segment here uh, in uh, green, uh, the, ac the, the axon shaft itself, presynaptic boutons where you have contact with target cells, and in growing uh, axons, the growth cone at the tip of the axon. And this architecture relies on a unique organization of the cytoskeleton. So what we're doing is trying to understand the organization of uh, the axonal cytoskeleton so that we can understand how we can shape, build, maintain, and transform uh, these compartments all along the life of the organism in physiological and pathological conditions. So to look at the cytoskeleton, uh, the classic way and the, and the most used way is to use fluorescent microscopy. And you see here from an historical uh, review, uh, examples of the first uh, fluorescent images of the neuronal cytoskeleton, tubulin and actin at the top here from a 1978 article. And what we do today, which is classical actin and tubulin staining in, in neurons from a more recent paper. The problem with fluorescent microscopy is that there is a limit to the amount of detail you can get from an optical microscope, which is caused by the diffraction of light. Even if you have something infinitely small, what you will get on your camera or detector is a spot, a spot that is around 200 nanometers in width and 500 nanometers in height. And this spot is called uh, the point spread function PSF. So if you zoom in on in, on a fluorophore that are only a few nanometers, like here, individual fluorophore, you don't get a small dots. You get this spot, this point spread function that is what get, gets out of the microscope due to diffraction. And these spots are around 200 nanometers wide. And if you use fluorescence microscopy to look at part of a neuron here, a dendrite stain for MAP2, you have actin stain in green that shows you the spines and bassoon where the, the presynaptic uh, uh, the presynaptics connect to these spines. And you see that this image is pixelated, but it's also a bit blurry because the details, for example, of the bassoon presynapses is around the same size than the PSF. So you cannot get any detail within uh, that uh, range of uh, dimension. And 
Fortunately, for a few years now, we have new techniques that allow to bypass uh, this fundamental limitation of optical microscopy. And these techniques are collectively termed super resolution microscopy. And you can see a few examples from different techniques that uh, shows you how we can now look at the neuronal cytoskeleton in much greater detail with all the advantages of fluorescence microscopy, like specificity of labeling for a given uh, component and ease of use compared to electron microscopy. So the technique we use mostly in the lab is called single molecule localization microscopy. And the principle is actually quite simple, is that instead of looking at your fluorescence labeling, like here on the left, where you look at all the fluorophore at once, you put your sample in a situation where you have blinking of the fluorophore. So at any given time, you don't have all of them that are on, but only a few of them that are isolated because it's sparsely activated and fluorescing. And you can fit the position of each of these individual fluorophores with a much greater precision than the size of the PSF. So you can say the center of this dot is exactly here, even if this dot is 200 nanometer wide. Of course, you do that, you will get 10 fluorophore position, and you will have to get thousands or tens of thousands of images to reconstruct progressively all the fluorophores in your staining and reconstruct your final image. So you acquire tens of thousands of images of a blinking sample, and, and you fit all the positions of all the fluorophore, and in the end, you obtain uh, the very precise reconstruction of your labeling. And this is the principle of single molecule localization microscopy. There are different ways of making a blink, uh, uh, to make a blinking uh, sample. And the class, the most classic is to use STORM, which is you use a, a classic immunolabeling, but you put the sample in a situation with a reducing buffer and a high intensity of illumination, where instead of emitting continuously, each three or four will blink from time to time. Or you use another technique that is called DNA paint, where instead of putting the fluorophore directly on the antibodies, you put a small DNA sequence on the antibody and you put an imager strand that has the small complementary sequence of DNA so that the imager strands are just you know, floating in the medium and they make a, a small homogeneous background because it's Brownian diffusion very fast. And when one of these imagers uh, hybridize with the target, hybridize with the docking strand on the antibody, it's immobilized and this makes a blinking because the, the fluorophore is immobilized for a short period of time because these strands are short. And after processing and fitting, you can uh, uh, reconstruct the images exactly in the same way, whereas you are doing a uh, storm or paint uh, uh, initially. So what do we do with single molecule localization microscopy? We are in particular interested in the organization of actin along axis. And this whole field was started back in 2013 by the lab of Jia Wezhuang at Harvard, when she found that when you look at actin along axons in culture neurons, it doesn't look like much by diffraction limited fluorescence microscopy. You see here something quite homogeneous, but the corresponding storm image reveals a striking assembly of periodically spaced rings of actin all along the axon. You see all these rings and the distance between any of these rings is 190 nanometers, just below uh, the limit of the diffraction. This is why you don't see any pattern uh, at the diffraction limited level. And why is this distance 190 nanometers? This is because uh, the, uh, each of these actin rings is spaced from the next one by a tetramer of spectrin, a layer of spectrin tetramers, and the spectrin tetramers have a length of 190 nanometers. So this is a striking periodic scaffold uh, that lines the membrane of the axon. And this is the kind of images of this periodic scaffold we can do in the lab uh, these days. So we can do multicolor uh, imaging, uh, imaging the spectrin tetramers. You see here different spectrins in the initial segment. Yellow, it's beta for spectrin in the proximal axon, the initial segment. And in orange is the distal axon that contains beta 2 spectrin. And you see that these spectrin tetramer are interspaced uh, between the actin rings in gray in both the proximal and distal axon. This is also what we can do. We can do that in 3D. Uh, so you see here this color coded for Z and we can make 3D reconstruction and play with them. Like here I made small movies where you can 
kind of roller coast along axons, and you see the periodic structure of the spectrins, and you also see that the resolution of SMLM gives us a striking view of the inside of the axon in the cross sections. You see those axons are not thicker than 500 nanometers, and yet we see perfectly that the spectrin is just a submembrane layer, and we see the lumen of the axon all along their lengths. So, we have good techniques. We can visualize this periodic uh, uh, scaffold. And you see here with even three colors, actin, spectrin, as I told you. And adducin is an actin-associated protein that is co-localizing with the actin rings. The problem, even when you look at this image, it's, it's great to be able to have this kind of 20 to 30 nanometer resolution. But still, you don't see individual actin filaments. So you don't exactly know what are these actin rings, what, um, what are they made of, how many filaments, how are they organized. So I was really uh, 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 eager to get a more ultra structural insight into this very unique actin organization. So we teamed with uh, Stefan Vasilopoulos who is working at the Myology Institute in Paris. And Stefan is one of the few specialists in the world of this technique that's called platinum replica electron microscopy. You see him next to his uh, 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 beloved uh, electron microscope. And you see one of these uh, platinum replica EM image next to him. And you see that you can get images of clattering uh, assemblies at the membrane and individual actin filaments with great contrast and resolution. So how does this work? What you do is that you take your cell in culture and you use a solicator, the same thing you use to make membrane prep for biochemistry, and you just blast your cells very quickly so that the ultrasound will just remove the upper part of the cell. This is what is called unroofing. And you are left with just the ventral part of the cell that you can then fix and make a platinum carbon replica of it that you then lift from the glass and put on an EM grid. And you are looking, this image show you actually the, uh, 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 the, the inner face of the plasma membrane or the ventral side of the membrane attached to the glass. And what we found was that we could unroof neurons in culture, which was never done before. And if we do that and we label with antibodies without permeabilization to check that we were able to, to open the cells, we can label the cell body and the proximal neuride, the axon and the dendrite with spectrin antibodies showing that we managed to open them. So of course, the question was, this is a quite traumatizing experience for neurons. So is the periodic scaffold uh, perturbed or conserved after this uh, uh, unroofing? And the answer is that the periodic scaffold at the ventral side of the membrane is still perfectly organized. And you see here storm images of unroofed uh, axons that shows you the, the membrane organization, the actin rings and the spectrin uh, that are spacing them. So the question is, what does it look like when we then do platinum replica and look at it with electron microscopy? What you see here is a cell body of a neuron and it's neurite and in yellow, it's the start of the axon. And this whole part has been well unroofed. The white parts are the ones that are not unroofed. And if you zoom on an axon, you see uh, these are the microtubules that look like overcooked pasta because they make bundles at the start of the axon. But what is interesting for us is just under the membrane here is the mesh uh, 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 that is lining the membrane. And if I zoom on this square uh, uh, part here, you see what happens here is these filaments vertical here on the images and colored in magenta. And they really look like actin filaments for PREM specialists, and they are spaced every 190 nanometer perpendicular to the axon. So we were very happy and say, well, we are seeing finally these actin rings by electron microscopy. Of course, we had to confirm that these were indeed actin rings by making immunogold labeling. Uh, uh, and also, we can look at it in, uh, uh, look at the uh, topology of it because you can make tomography with the PREM. And we could demonstrate that these were indeed actin filaments and that the yellow connectors you see here are the spectrin. So, uh, job done, we have demonstrated that we can see uh, the actin rings. Uh, by electron microscopy, and we can study their exact organization. The final demonstration that the rings that are seen by storm, by the optical superposition microscopy, and the, 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 the actin filaments seen by PREM are the same thing, 
is to do correlative imaging. And so we set up correlative storm and prem. If we unroof neurons, we label the actin with phalloidin and we make a storm image. And this is what you see here, the beginning of this axon. You see the periodic uh, actin rings. And then we just make a kind of circular marker on this particular neuron and do a platinum replica electron microscopy image. And then Stefan in Paris finds the same exact area and make the prem image. And then as it's molecular resolution, there is no problem to align uh, the two images because you have a very high uh, precision on both images. And you see that we can superimpose uh, the two images. And what you'd see is that if you look at where the actin rings are on the storm image, and then you look at the prem image, you see that this corresponds indeed to these vertical actin filaments that are periodically spaced. And what you see also is that you don't see them all along their lengths in the platinum replica image because it goes in and out of the spectrin mesh, but the phalloidin really goes all along the filament. So you have a better view that they are really continuous filaments. So we could demonstrate that these actin rings were indeed uh, uh, seeable by electron microscopy. And of course, the idea is what do they look like? And they look like breads of two long filaments. And you see the gallery here at the bottom right. And this is very, uh, 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 this was very unexpected because people assumed that there were short capped filament by adducine. And we demonstrate that they are not short filaments, but long filament braided together, which is a completely unique actin structure that has, that has never been seen in any kind of cell. And that has very interesting, uh, um, consequences for mechanical properties and stability of this scaffold. So of course, we are uh, now working on this and trying to understand exactly how this structure can form uh, uh, along the axon. Another uh, um, example of something I would like to show is a recent collaboration with the lab of Subojit Roy, where we uh, got a bit further from the cytoskeleton. We look at Clatrin and clatrin forms, as you all know, clatrin coated pits that are, that are doing endocytosis uh, at the plasma membrane. But along the axon, there is a lot of clatrin. You see that in the axon here. And what uh, Sabojit uh, uh, and, and his postdoc Arkan and, 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 and we could demonstrate is that actually most of these uh, uh, clatrin clusters in the axon are not clatrin coated pits, but they are transport intermediates. Clatrin is transported from the cell body to the presynapses. And this is uh, what makes uh, uh, all these clusters. And we could see that in live cell imaging, but also we used two color paint to really look at this structure. And we saw that they are not contacting the membrane. And we used a, a software to make a rendering so that we could precisely visualize these as objects and, and uh, Sorry, and quantify uh, their size and distribution. And you see that in this portion of the axon, which is uh, less than one micron, you see all these different clusters of clattering. Some of them are clattering coated pits, like the one in the middle contacting the membrane, but the others are really in the middle transported along the axon. And this is, again, a completely new structure that has never been uh, uh, seen by uh, any uh, uh, previous uh, uh, study. And what are we doing now? What's the next step for our imaging uh, is to use more uh, super resolution techniques and to grow further than storm and paint. And of course, what we want to do is live cell super resolution imaging because what I showed you, all of this is done in fixed cells because it takes a long time to make these blinking sample images. So we are branching out to new techniques like uh, uh, spinning disk SORA and uh, structured illumination microscopy. And this is done thanks to investment uh, in the facility of INP, the NCIS facility, which uh, uh, started uh, this year a partnership with Nikon uh, Instruments. And we uh, became a Nikon Center of Excellence for Neuro Nano Imaging partnership between Ex Marseille University and Nikon for easy access and, uh, and uh, uh, constant upgrade of all these microscopes. And, uh, and, and I'm very excited about what this microscope will allow us to do. And some example, we can now go live and look at clattering in this neuron. This is traditional uh, uh, spinning this microscopy. So we have a large field of view and we can see uh, the kind of 
uh, wiggling around of uh, uh, clattering structure, but they are so dense that it's difficult to, to separate each of the clattering uh, uh, cluster. So thankfully with the SORA module, we can, we can now have a better resolution. And you see here on the right, the kind of uh, movies we can make compared to the classical spinning disk. And, and this is like, like night and day, we can really see each of these structure. And here there is an additional uh, step uh, that is that we have a deep learning restoration and denoising so that we even get a bit better quality uh, by processing after uh, the super resolution imaging so that we have really the best possible uh, quality in our imaging. And with the sim, it's the same. We can see here clattering coated pits and clattering clusters moving along in axons and in dendrites. And you see that the resolution is, is not, of course, the same as the SMLM. We're not at 20 or 30 nanometer, but we go down to half of the diffraction limited resolution, around 100, 120 nanometers, which is an area where a lot of interest in biology happens. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions. And uh, if you are interested, if you're a student, we are hiring postdocs and engineers this year. So uh, let me know and I'll be happy to discuss with you. And this is, uh, these are all the, the collaborators we have, people in the team, partners and founding. So I'll stop now and, and listen to you. Thank you. Thank you, Christophe. So uh, it's time for the questions. So we want to favor the oral questions. And um, of course, if you uh, have questions, you can also write them in the Q&R panel. So uh, if anyone has a question, please uh, raise your hand and I will um, give you access to the microphone. So, um, Chris, Lydia. I can't hear any question right now. No, Lydia wants to ask a question, so. Oh, okay. yes. I, I, oh, Hello, Christophe. I hear you, Lydia. Hi, Lydia. Hi. I, I was wondering whether the very unique uh, scaffold structure you have shown is specific for the axon, or is it also found uh, in some dendritic compartment? Yes, it's uh, so people have found it also. We see it in very mature neurons. Uh, we, we start to see it also along dendrites, and for example, also along the neck of dendritic spines. So the idea is that this is more a topology-driven organization. Like as soon as you have a tube of membrane that is really, really thin, the spectrin and actin, if you have a cell that has spectrin and actin, uh, uh, will start to organize uh, like this with rings connected by spectrins. Whereas when you have a large, flat membrane, like in erythrocyte or the cell body of neurons, you will get a more hexagonal organization that was known for a long time, that actin and spectrin will, will make hexagons in two different mentioned, but when it's a syn tube, you will more have rings connected by, uh, by, by single tetramers. Thank you. Uh, next question, Santiago. Yeah. Thank you for this wonderful talk, Christophe. Uh, I was wondering if you can tell us how much of these uh, techniques that you have been uh, successfully using in culture, uh, what is your prediction of uh, uh, regular use of the same type of approaches in uh, tissue? So uh, this is a, a very good question. Extending those techniques to tissue is a real challenge. Uh, it can be done, uh, but uh, it's, it's, it's really uh, still a challenge because uh, either, for example, for single molecule localization microscopy, you have to be able to detect single uh, molecule emission deep in a tissue with a lot of uh, aberration and a lot of dispersion. So, so it requires to have uh, sophisticated uh, things like people have, have, have been using adaptive optics to, uh, uh, to kind of uh, remove the optical aberration at a certain depth. Of course, if you want to do slices and look at the first 10 microns of your slices, you can do it 
quite easily. And a lot of people have done, for example, work in uh, for synapses and the structure of synapses by just looking at the very uh, 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 the very uh, thin layer on top of synapses. But as soon as you want to go deeper, then the optic starts to be a problem and it becomes much more of a challenge. And to these days, I, I don't think there are techniques, uh, uh, there are ameliorations of SIM and, and SMLM that can really commercially uh, go deeper. So it is, it, these are techniques that are indeed more adapted uh, to, to, to cultured cells or monolayers and SIM samples. Thank you. So we also have a question uh, in the Q&R panel from Uli Wanek. Excellent yes. talk. I, 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 I so yeah. Okay. So 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 Uli is asking how we can do storm in live neurons because of course if you have to acquire for 15 minutes and you have 20 nanometer resolution everything has moved for much more than 20 nanometers during this time. And, and the answer is uh, quite simple. We don't do a storm on live neurons because exactly we have that problem that things move much faster than our imaging can, uh, can, can image them. So, so this is why what I showed you for storm and paint was only fixed samples. And then we want to do live cell imaging. We rely on other techniques like structured illumination microscopy or uh, uh, this uh, reassignment spinning disk method. And these methods allow to go much faster. So SIM can reliably do uh, 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 one image per second. Uh, uh, spinning disk is more like 100 image per second if you have enough light. And as the resolution is not 20 nanometers, but 100 nanometers, of course, you are also more immune to small movements. So you go faster, you have a bit less resolution, and this allows you to do super resolution imaging uh, in live cells. Uh, okay. Oh, I, I have a, a question, uh, actually. I was wondering whether um, the live super resolution techniques will invalidate um, the conclusion drawn by study using uh, quantum dots, for example, to uh, live track and localize receptors. Yes, this is a very good point. So when I said storm and pain cannot image live neurons, there is a particular uh, 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 case of single molecule imaging, which is what is called SPT, single particle tracking with quantum dots or even fluorophores. Uh, as had been done for uh, uh, more than 20 years, for example, by, by people in Bordeaux, Daniel Choquet and his collaborators. And this is a particular case where you can actually do single molecule imaging in living cells because you are not reconstructing a structure, but you are following single objects. And this gives you a lot of, uh, of insight and very complementary to actually doing structural reconstruction. And, and this is, uh, so, so the live cell uh, super resolution is very useful to have this structural insight. But if you want to follow, for example, a single AMPA receptor uh, uh, or, uh, or a single uh, uh, or a single protein, uh, then these are the SPT and the, and the, and the following them with quantum dots is really the best technique you can have. And actually, this you can combine these two techniques. And it has been done, for example, by uh, by Helge Ewers in Berlin. Uh, so they did. Uh, tracking of lipids at the, at the membrane of the axon. And then they fix the cell and they do a storm image of the actin rings. And they saw that the, actually the diffusion is kind of constrained in between each actin ring. So the lipid has to jump from one compartment to another by this correlative approach. So, so, it's, so I would say that the best is to actually implement correlative and to complement these techniques together so that you have the dynamic tracking of single objects and the structural view from super resolution microscopy. Okay, thank you, Christophe. Um, one last question uh, by Bernadette Dahl. Hi. Hello. Um, yeah, so I'm Bernadette. I'm from Tübingen, uh, just uh, so you know. Um, I found this a very, very interesting talk, I must say. Uh, I wanted to ask with the tissue if you could um, combine clarity with the storm. I mean, you would lose all the membrane bound proteins but um, the cytoskeletal structure might stay intact. So could you combine these methods and then actually see a bit more also into tissue like yes. inside? Yes, I, I would say that combining uh, these techniques uh, with any kind of, uh, of a clarifying procedure, might be clarity, might be even expansion microscopy, uh, anything that will basically remove most of your sample lens and, and leave you with the fluorophores, 
uh, is actually very useful because you remove most of the optical aberration because you basically have just a block of water with fluorophor in it rather than a tissue with lipids and stuff that are optically uh, diffusing and, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and that are, uh, impact your imaging. So uh, you are totally right. Uh, you could, I think it's more, it's easier to do storm or sim or any of these techniques in a clarified uh, sample. And that is a, a great combination uh, that some of people are attempting. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christophe, for your nice talk. Thank you. And uh, we will move to our next uh, presentation by uh, Silvia Di Angel Antonio, a professor in physiology at Sapienza University, and you work in the biophysics lab as well as at the Center for Life, Nano, and Neuroscience. And today you will talk about modeling neurodevelopmental diseases using brain organoids and talk about the case of Fragile X syndrome. So, so thank you very much for your introduction and uh, for inviting me in this uh, first uh, CIVIS uh, Neuroscience Symposium. Okay, so let's uh, start to introduce you our work uh, that we are currently um, conducting uh, on, cerebral, on the use of cerebral organoids for the study of different neurodevelopmental disorders. So if you look uh, at uh, on Google uh, at uh, cerebral organoids, you will find that uh, the most uh, uh, prominent uh, uh, images is this image of a brain organ that has been developed by Dr. Madeleine Lancaster in the laboratory of uh, Noblick uh, in 2000 and published on, on this seminal paper on nature on 2013. And indeed, uh, this was the first demonstration that uh, it is possible to grow in a dish a three-dimensional structure that is uh, resembling the development uh, of a human brain. And uh, starting from this, uh, starting from the use of this type uh, of three-dimensional structures, uh, in vitro structures uh, for the study of the neurodevelopment, we try to uh, use uh, this uh, type of cons constructs uh, in order to study a neurodevelopmental disease that is called Fragile X. So Fragile X uh, is one of the most common inherited form of human mental retardation and is uh, caused uh, by the triplet replication and the epigenetic silencing of the fMR1 gene that uh, is placed on the uh, X chromosome. And these uh, uh, fragile X uh, are chromosomes are really uh, different when are looked at under the microscope. And indeed, uh, the mutation that uh, are causing uh, fragile X uh, are the CGG in abnormal CGG replication in the, the gene coding for fMRP protein. And if uh, these uh, mm, replication are less than uh, 44, this type, and at least 50, these uh, people with the under 50 replication have normal protein production. Then the, if the replication are between 55 and 200, we call this type of a situation pre-mutation. But when the replication are more than 200, these cause hypermethylation and gene silencing. So people that have more than 200 replication do not produce uh, the fMRP protein. And the fMRP protein loss uh, has been linked to a variety of uh, um, uh, phenotypes uh, in which uh, um, neuronal uh, connection and neuronal function are very imp are really impaired. Indeed, 
uh, fMRP that is uh, abundant in neuronal tissue and in testes is a RNA binding protein and is known to bind a lot of different microRNAs and also messenger RNAs and control their location and protein translation, especially at synapses. And uh, mm, what has been demonstrated is that uh, there are a lot of channelopathies. So uh, pathologies that are linked to the function of specific ion channels, both at the level of presynaptic uh, site and at the level of postsynaptic site, and also that uh, control neuronal excitability. So what uh, we wanted to do was to try to understand how in a humanized model of a fragile X syndrome, we can try to understand the function of this uh, abnormal replication or gene loss of or protein loss and to try to mimic in vitro what is present in patients in vivo. So uh, our bricks for to build at the end, the personalized organoids are induced pluripotent stem cells that, uh, as probably, probably all of you know, are reprogramming reprogrammed cells from terminally differentiated cells that uh, can be converted into stem cells that self-replicate and that can be and then differentiated virtually in all type of um, cell body cells. So uh, we can take advantage of uh, IPS from control or for people or from patients and then to convert them into brain cells. Or we can, and we can assemble this type of cells uh, uh, with different type of 3D assembly, and we can also produce uh, brain organoids. And this uh, is uh, thanks to uh, two great uh, discoveries that have been made uh, in the last 10 years, and that have been awarded by Nobel Prize, uh, one in 2012, that is the Nobel Prize for the discovery of reprogramming of major cells into pluripotent stem cells, and the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2020 for the development of CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing. And indeed, starting from human IPS, from control human IPS, we developed together with the group of Professor Alessandro Rosa here in Sapienza University, we developed two lines of human iPS cells that have the same genetic background. So a control line of iPS and an isogenic line that has been uh, gene edited in order to knock out only the gene for fMRP, so fMR1. So we starting from this type of cells, uh, two of uh, our uh, PhD students, uh, Carlo Brighi and Federico Salaris, um, set up a very nice uh, protocol for differentiating cells in a very efficient way to mature neurons, and uh, then, uh, and also to collect frozen samples that can be then used for, uh, for uh, major neuron differentiation. And indeed, in 2D culture, we were able to obtain different type of cells, of uh, uh, cortical cells. In, and in this culture, we have excitatory and inhibitory neurons, but we also have astrocytes if we go on during the culture. And indeed on these cells, we can do uh, molecular characterization, cellular characterization, morphological analysis, but also we did patch clamp recordings and calcium imaging. Unfortunately, we have no time to show everything. So I will uh, show you only some results. And uh, using the, knock the isogenic knockout lines, we did the, the same type of uh, mm, 
differentiation, and we check that these cells do not express the FMRP protein as we expected. So we uh, differentiated both line into cortical cells, and uh, we obtained a mixed culture of uh, cells. As I told you before, we have both uh, uh, glutamatergic uh, um, and the GABAergic neurons, so excitatory and inhibitory neurons, and we also have uh, um, astrocytes in, that, in these cultures. And so we look at the, at the expression of excitatory and inhibitory markers, uh, looking at uh, expression of presynaptic and postsynaptic uh, uh, glutamatergic components. And what we observed was that uh, in cells uh, deriving from uh, knockout culture, we have uh, an increase in the uh, glutamatergic components, both at presynaptic and postsynaptic level. And looking also at colocalization puncta, we observe an increase uh, in colocalized puncta of excitatory transmission in uh, knockout cultures. And uh, sorry, okay. When we look at, uh, at uh, the GABAergic component, we did not observe a significant uh, difference, uh, but uh, we uh, observed uh, a slight tendency that was not significant. So in our uh, um, first idea, we think that uh, from a morphological analysis that was also confirmed by mRNA analysis, we have an increase in the glutamatergic transmission respect to the GABAergic one. But we will go on on that. When we look at also at the astrocytes component in this culture and counting cells and also looking at the number the, the number of GFP positive and S100 beta positive cells, we observed an increase in glutama in astrocyte um, fluorescence, GFP positive fluorescence in this in culture of knockout uh, cells. And so we wondered if uh, these uh, morphological difference can be mirrored in terms of activity of these cells. I don't know if you can, I hope you can see the videos. These are record, sample recordings of calcium uh, dynamics in these cells in uh, control conditions. So these are spontaneous calcium events recorded using uh, calcium dyes that is fluorophore in these two types of cultures. And when we analyze these uh, uh, calcium events, we uh, were able to distinguish two different uh, groups of events. So the fast rising and decaying events and the slow rising and decay events on these cells. And we divided this type of events into groups that in, the, in a blind condition were just divided on the basis of kinetics. And uh, we observed that uh, the number of cells that uh, were uh, displaying fast and slowing uh, events were sim was similar in uh, knockout and wild type uh, culture. And uh, also the number of uh, active cells was similar, but uh, when we uh, look at, uh, at the um, characteristics of these cells, uh, we found that uh, in that uh, uh, knockout culture displayed an increase um, mm, both in fast and slow events, uh, higher, uh, mm, bigger events in terms of amplitude. So bigger calcium events in fast component and bigger fast the bigger uh, calcium events uh, in the slow cells. Um, then uh, in terms of fast cells, we have also an increase in the frequency of events. 
And uh, when we compare the type, uh, when we match the, uh, the um, traces uh, with the cells that uh, display the traces uh, in terms uh, of morphology, uh, fast events were typical of neuron-like events and slow events were typical of uh, astrocytes-like cells. So uh, we have an increase in the neuronal components and also in the glial, maybe glial components in terms of uh, calcium activity. Then we moved to another type of uh, calcium recording. So looking at the single cell response uh, at uh, glutamate or, or GABA. And while it's uh, easy to understand and it's uh, uh, nice, uh, is uh, um, this type of uh, um, graph, uh, maybe uh, we have to spend some more words on that one. So the first one uh, reflects the fact that when we apply glutamate to this culture, we have that the response to glutamate in knockout culture is higher respect to the uh, wild type neuron. So the response to the glutamatergic agonist is bigger in knockout. But uh, what we can see here is also that uh, the response to GABA in knockout neurons is bigger, bigger in terms of calcium response. So GABAergic response per se cannot be glue, uh, something that induce uh, per se a calcium flux uh, since GABA uh, receptors are not permeable to calcium, but uh, this uh, can be an indirect measure of uh, a GABA uh, in uh, unbalanced GABAergic response. So a GABAergic response that is depolarizing neurons respect to hyperpolarizing neurons. So we, uh, and this was a, a really uh, a big difference between knockout animal, uh, sorry, knockout culture and wild type culture. So up to here, we can summarize the first part of our work that is still in 2D and not on organoids, in which uh, we demonstrated that in the 2D uh, model based on knockout uh, IPS, we obtained an increase in the glutamatergic component respect to the GABAergic component uh, respect in knockout respect to wild type and an unbalance between excitation and inhibition in these cultures. And also that we observe an increased glial GFP positive proliferation in knockout culture. So, but then we wanted to move from the 2D to 3D in vitro culture, base, basing our uh, strategies uh, on the strategy described in the Lancaster paper. So we uh, used a um, protocol of uh, generation of brain organoids that is based on the formation of embryo bodies, uh, then a neural induction phase, then organoids can be in, embedded in, have to be embedded in matrigel and then they grow on a shaker in the incubator in order to obtain the maturation of the cerebral organoids. And as you can see in uh, using a, a transmitted images, so you can see that in the organoid we can look, we can identify some cortical plate formation. We can identify ventricle-like structure and subventricular right regions that are stained with encaderin, MAP2, and PAC6. And uh, we then uh, generated the two, 3D organoids, the cortical, the brain organoids, starting from both lines, uh, FMRP wild type and FMRP knockout lines. And what we uh, obtained uh, as a first result was that knockout organoids are significantly bigger in size than the corresponding wild type ones. Remember that these lines are 
isogenic cell lines. So we have the same genetic background and uh, we can think that only the knockout of the single gene can account for the difference that we are looking at and that we can find. So we found this first result. This was not paralleled by different expression of TAGI or MAP2, so neuronal markers were similarly uh, staining the organoids, but when we observed the, the staining for GFP positive cells in our organoids, we obtain that uh, the staining was increased in knockout organoids, but also counting cells positive for GFP, we observed an increased number of GFP positive cells in these organoids. So uh, uh, we observed this both at day 70 and going on with the uh, growing and maturation protocol until day 100. So uh, what we can summarize here at the second point at, is that we generated a novel brain organoid fragile X model that is based on human no isogenic knockout IPS that the lack of MRP does not compromise the correct alignment of cortical structures that we observe both in wild type and knockout organoids, but that knockout organoids show increased proliferation of glial cells and bigger organoid size. However, we still have uh, some problems on that because uh, uh, this type of model suffers of uh, a known uh, problem that is the batch variability. So what has been demonstrated by a lot of different uh, laboratory is that these self-assembled uh, um, organoids uh, grow in different way and are different uh, between different batches. And uh, the second point uh, that uh, we have uh, as a problem is that uh, these uh, are good model has uh, isogenic model in order to dissect uh, which feature can be uh, affected by the mutation or the knockout, but they are not patient specific organoids. So uh, it should be nice to move from here to patient-derived IPSCs and so to produce patient-specific organoids. And the third, last but not least problem is that as you can imagine, these uh, organoids uh, do not have uh, microglial cells that we know are very important uh, in the correct wiring and functioning of uh, the brain. And this is because microglia comes from the uh, hematopoietic origin, while organoids are producing, pushing the IPS towards the production of the neural line. So uh, what we need is to produce microglia in using an hematopoietic lineage and then differentiation and then to insert microglia during the development of brain organs. So we are trying to fix these bugs. And to do that, we, uh, are move we moved to uh, another protocol that has been then uh, obtained and, and developed in the laboratory in Cambridge of Madeleine Lancaster, that is the, the development of region-specific organoid, and in particular cortical organoids, that uh, have, uh, do not suffer of uh, the uh, strong batch variability as before. And uh, uh, using this, taking advantage of the lack of batch variability, we are doing this using the wild type line and the knockout line as a control and a patient derived line that is uh, this uh, IPSF 
x eleven seven that has four hundred and thirty five CGG repeats and comes from a patient. And so in this way, we will have three different groups of organoids, the control, the knockout, and the patient derived one. And uh, um, last but not least, uh, we are also uh, trying to obtain microglia from both, uh, from the three uh, IPS that uh, I mentioned here. So uh, the first uh, preliminary result that uh, I can show you from uh, this type uh, of uh, experiments are uh, confirming what we saw for uh, the glial part of the our of uh, the organoids. So uh, both uh, looking at the uh, uh, RNA level and uh, looking also. Uh, at the GFP expression, we have uh, that uh, at day 15, the patient derived the human cortical organoid display increased expression of GFP positive cells. So now we hope to have a model that uh, recapitulates all the feature at the level of glial cells and neuronal cells that have been already demonstrated in some knockout mod mouse model of Fragile X and that have been reported also in the brains of Fragile X patients. Uh, so uh, this can give us a um, promising tool for the study of Fragile X in a humanized model and also can help people to have personalized organoids in, all, in order also maybe to develop uh, drugs and to test the drug reposition. So we need to do a lot of things right now, but I want just to uh, thank all the people that are involved in this work and especially, uh, Professor Alessandro Rosa that uh, shared with me uh, this type of work and uh, all our students and postdoc, Carlo, Federico and uh, Alessandro, uh, first of all, and then also Federica, Chia Caterina, Chiara and Maria and Silvia. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you, Silvia, um, for your talk. So now it's time, five minutes for a few questions. Uh, so the first one from Lydia. Yes, uh, um, thank you, Silvia. You nicely showed that uh, the knockout uh, IPS show increased glutamate transmission and increased response to glutamate. I was wondering whether you have checked to the expression of the glutamate transporters, for instance, GLT1. So are the excitatory glutamate transporters not normally expressed? Uh, okay, we are doing that. Uh, we didn't do it uh, in the first, uh, in the first batches of organoids. So we are collecting different time points right now. As you saw, we need 100 days in cultures. So we are collecting different batches. And our idea now is to look at GLT-1 uh, and GLAST, but also other specific markers of uh, uh, on the astrocytic counterpart of glutamatergic transmission, like called some GLUR5, but also uh, glutamine synthetase and uh, other astrocytic markers that can uh, play, uh, play some role in glutamatergic transmission at all. Thank you. Um, next question, Pascal Durbeck. Um, thank you very much for your, your talk, Sylvia. Um, 
I was wondering, so if I understand correctly, you think that the increase in size is due to an excess of proliferation of astrocytes. Do you think these astrocytes are closer to reactive astrocytes? Or do you just have an excess of astrocytes produced during the organoid formation? So my guess is that they can be either reactive or uh, immature astrocytes um, we uh, that's uh, this is this is related to uh, the previous uh, answer uh, and uh, is that uh, we want to look uh, at uh, different astrocytic parameter not only uh, mm, glutamate transporters and glutamine synthetases but also um, we want to look at uh, potassium channel, uh, key IR, uh, um, that is typical of astrocytes, uh, and uh, uh, AMGLUR5 that can give us some uh, yeah. information on uh, astrocyte uh, uh, phenotype. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Silvia, for, for this nice talk. Uh, actually, my questions were um, uh, already done by my colleagues, uh, but I would like to make an extension of that, and I would wonder whether you think that there is a general uh, inflammatory uh, process going on, and that beyond glutamate transporters can be a sort of a general burst of uh, inflammatory uh, cytokines that are released in the media and may affect the way uh, neurons develop. Okay, so in that type of model, it's quite difficult to think of a general inflammatory condition. Uh, and uh, uh, first of all, because we don't have microglia and uh, um, we can have an, something that is mediated by astrocyte uh, phenotype or astrocyte reactivity. Um, but uh, uh, I think that uh, at this stage, we cannot answer to this question. Okay, we'll wait for the next meeting. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank so, you. Bye-bye. So Bye-bye. So we'll move um, to our next uh, lecturer uh, with uh, Catherine Frank. She is a group leader at Tübingen. Their lab is uh, called Neuronal Circuits of Vision. And today she will uh, talk about uh, vi visual feature extraction across the mouse early visual system. Uh, so Catherine, the stage is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me well and see my slides? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for this introduction and also for the opportunity to um, talk today. Um, in the next 20 minutes, I would like to give you an overview of our work, which focuses on um, how the early visual system of mice um, extracts uh, visual features. So in general, the task that the visual system has to solve is extremely challenging. From millions of bits of information that enter our eyes every second, it has to extract a few bits that are then relevant to initiate a behavior that ensures survival. And it is important to remember that what is relevant critically depends on the animal species specific needs. And this is because different animals live in very different natural environments with very distinct statistics. For example, the bird looks very different in the forest compared to underwater. However, even in the same environment, what is relevant depends on the task that the animal has to perform. And these different aspects are nicely illustrated in the following movie. So here the hawk requires a relatively high spatial resolution to detect the mouse from a large distance in the sky. However, the mouse might not care so much about a high resolution, but it needs to detect the approaching predator from above and elicit an appropriate action. This could be running as fast as possible. However, the animal also has to constantly reevaluate the incoming information. And at some point, hiding might be the better strategy to not be detected. And to understand how neural circuits across the visual system process this input, 
to allow this behavior is one of the ultimate goals in neuroscience. And this processing already starts in the retina. So the retina is a, um, a piece of neural tissue at the, that is located at the back of the eyeball. And the incoming image is trans uh, transferred from the photoreceptors via interneurons, the bipolar cells, to the uh, retina's output neurons, the retinal ganglion cells. And this um, vertical excitatory pathway is modulated by two classes of inhibitory neurons, the horizontal cells in the outer and the amma green cells in the inner retina. So the blueprint of the vertebrate retina is highly conserved across species with some species specific modifications, like for example, the fovea that is present in primates and also some birds. So because all of the information that comes goes from the eye to the brain has to pass the bottleneck of the optic nerve, the visual information is already extensively processed by retinal circuits. But how exactly does the retina process visual information? Or in other words, what information does the eye send to the brain? And the classical view is that retinal neurons are organized in a center surround, um, have a center surround receptive field. So this means that they are activated by a spot in their receptive field center and that they decrease their activity upon a spot in their um, surround. And then the incoming, each pixel of the incoming image would then be filtered by the center surround receptive field before the information is sent to the brain. However, um, early studies have already shown that the um, picture is much more complex than that. For example, in the study, what the frog's eye tells the frog's brain, Ledwin and colleagues already described very complex neurons that, for example, only respond if a small spot of a dark spot of light um, is uh, positioned in their receptive field center, independent on the intensity of the background or motion in the background. So this is a very um, complex feature detector that might be ideally suited to detect a bug. And then this um, neuron could uh, directly initiate a motor response to um, catch this bug. Since these studies, a lot of research has shown that the retina indeed is not just decomposing the incoming image into many single pixels like a simple camera, but instead extracts different visual features like contrast, color, or edges, and that these are then sent to the brain in parallel. And since the first functional recordings of retinal neurons nearly 70 years ago, there has been the important question of how many um, feature channels does the eye send to the brain and what do they encode? And uh, during my PhD, we addressed this question using the mouse as a model organism. In general, because there are very few feedback projections from the brain to the eye in mammals, the retinal circuit can be considered intact in an ex vivo and isolated preparation, as you can see here. And then to systematically monitor the signal the eye sends to the brain, we have labeled the explanted uh, retina with a calcium dye and then recorded the population activity of the retina's output layer while projecting different light stimuli onto the photoreceptor array. For every neuron, we were then able to extract a detailed response profile capturing its functional properties. And using um, an unsupervised clustering approach, we um, grouped 10,000 of such profiles into more than 30 functionally distinct types. For example, a neuron that responds to fast increments of light, other neurons that respond to motion in a particular direction, or that encode a high uh, frequency flicker. And this number was, um, to our surprise, this number was approximately twice the number of previous estimates and illustrated that the information channel from the mouse's eye to the brain are substantially more diverse than previously thought. So we can now go back to the recorded neurons and color code each neuron according to its functional type assignment. And this movie nicely illustrates the functional um, diversity that is available um, to the brain. Um, and that's illustrated by the fact that different colors light up during different times of this exact same stimulus. And the theoretical studies suggest that splitting the visual input into a large number of uh, very distinct um, output channels um, decreases redundancy and results in a more efficient code of the information to the brain. So since the study, other studies have confirmed the large number of uh, retinal output channels that is uh, present in mice. 
And interestingly, a similarly large number of retinal channels is available in other species, suggesting that splitting the visual input into uh, many output channels is a common strategy across vertebrates. But here the question arises how the retina, um, how this functional diversity is generated, especially when you consider that only three, two synapses upstream, there are only three types of photoreceptors. And um, so we other research that we have done in the last years had, has addressed this um, question and revealed, for example, that um, in inhibitory um, interneurons are key to um, generate these diverse output channels and also that cell intrinsic properties, for example, um, dendritic integration contributes to diversifying the signal that is available to the brain. However, despite this uh, detailed knowledge about retinal processing that uh, we um, gathered uh, throughout the last decades by many labs, it is still relatively unclear how um, distinct types of retinal neurons interact to extract a single visual features, like for example, contrast, color, and edges, and how these are then integrated in downstream brain, brain areas. And in the last uh, few years, uh, we have addressed this question by focusing on color, a single visual feature that can be easily targeted by stimulus design and analysis. And color is an exciting aspect to look at because it is involved in a number of different behaviors. And also the way that color information is processed greatly differs across animal species. And we still know relatively little about color vision in mice. So behavioral evidence uh, has shown that mice are able to discriminate colors. However, uh, only in their upper visual field that samples the sky. And we were now interested to understand um, the neural correlates underlying this behavior and also what is special about color in the upper visual field. In general, um, the prerequisite for color vision is the existence of multiple photoreceptor types that are sensitive to different wavelengths. And mice have two uh, cone photoreceptors that are sensitive to UV light and green light and one green sensitive rod photoreceptor. So the problem with um, UV sensitive species like mice, zebrafish, or drosophila is that one cannot use um, conventional display devices optimized for humans because they do not emit any UV light. So um, in collaboration with um, two other labs, we have therefore developed um, an open source flexible uh, visual projector that is suitable for UV sensitive species like mice uh, with all the um, components um, available online for others to um, um, use and also build up on. And then we have used this uh, projector to investigate how the mouse retina processes um, color information that is present in the input. And so by recording the glutamatergic um, output of single cone photoreceptors, uh, we showed that color is already extracted in the mouse retina at the level of the photoreceptors by rod uh, cone interaction. And this results in antagonist or an opposite polarity response of a single photoreceptor to UV versus green light. And this rod cone opponency is different from the cone cone opponency that has been described in many vertebrates. Interestingly, a similar mechanism might underlie um, color vision that is observed in human patients that only have blue sensitive cones and rod photoreceptors. Uh, a study that has been uh, published a couple of decades ago, also from a lab here in Tübingen. And in our study, we further found that the neural representation of color becomes increasingly diverse towards the retinal output. And here, most color sensitive neurons that are here indicated in red are located in the ventral retina that samples the sky. And this asymmetric color processing across the retina um, likely underlies the um, superior color discrimination that has been reported for this region. However, here you might ask, so why does the mouse visual system predominantly extract color for only one half of the visual world? So might this bias already exist in the visual input and therefore favoring such an adaptation? And to address this question, I have been a part of a collaboration where we um, recorded the world through the eyes of mice using a custom camera. And this camera consists of a fisheye lens that uh, allows the wide opening angle of the mouse eye 
and two Raspberry Pi cameras uh, with UV and green filter that match the cone uh, photoreceptor sensitivities. And then here you can see an example movie that was recorded in the fields um, here in Tübingen. And we can now use these um, recorded natural movies to um, quantify specific statistics like luminance or um, contrast um, distributions. Since we were interested in color, we um, estimated the um, color content of these scenes using the uh, root mean square or RMS contrast. And here uh, in the bottom, we plotted the contrast of the UV channel versus the gr um, green channel for the lower and the upper visual field. So you can see that in the lower visual field, the contrasts mainly fall along this diagonal, meaning that they are um, similar and highly correlated. However, in the upper visual field, the um, plot looks much more scattered, meaning that the um, contrasts are more un uh, uncorrelated. And this revealed that indeed color contrast is, um, seems to be enriched in the upper visual field, at least for our um, recording conditions. And so this suggests that the fact that the mouse retina extracts color information mainly from this ventral part of the retina that samples the sky might be an adaptation to efficiently encode the statistics that are present in the visual input. And so this nicely um, demonstrates the link and the dependency between um, visual processing and uh, the, uh, the statistics of a natural input and also its ecological relevance. And therefore, visual circuit functions should ideally be studied using a more naturalistic input and also in the context of the animal's behavior. To uh, more closely link the retinal output to behavior, we um, are currently studying um, the important question how the brain processes the complex message from um, the eye to drive behavior. So for example, let's imagine that we have three um, neurons from the retina that target um, uh, post, uh, like postsynaptic neurons that are sensitive to contrast color and edges. So is the postsynaptic neuron then combining this information to um, generate a more complex and multifactorial readout of the scene? And if so, how? And ideally you want to study this, as I said, with a naturalistic input but also considering the animal's behavioral state. And this is because um, across uh, many animals from flies to humans, it is known that, for example, an active behavioral state uh, characterized by locomotion or alertness um, enhances visual responses. So the problem with um, this is that the interpretation of neural activity in response to naturalistic movies and also with respect to behavior is more difficult using conventional analysis methods. And to overcome this problem, I have started a collaboration with the labs of Andreas Tulias and Fabian Sins, where we have modified a recently developed modeling approach. And in this approach, we um, record the uh, neural activity of mouse primary visual cortex while the mouse are head fixed and positioned on a treadmill and presented with colored natural scenes. And then we can use the recorded activity to train an artificial neural network that um, then allows us to identify each neuron's optimal stimulus or receptive field. And importantly, this uh, modeling uh, approach allows us to incorporate behavioral parameters like pupil size and running speed that are associated with an active behavioral state. And like for many vertebrates, also in mice, the pupil size increases when the animal starts to run or is uh, alerted or aroused. And we have used this approach now to study how behavioral state influences stimulus selectivity in the context of um, colored natural scenes. And to our um, surprise, surprise we, found, we found that color preference actually changes with the behavior of the animal. So here you can see the optimal stimulus of the animal in a quiet behavioral state and its color tuning curve. So this neuron showed the strongest response for a stimulus that was green biased, meaning that it has higher contrast in the green compared to the UV channel. However, this changed um, significantly when the mouse started um, to run in an active state and had a larger pupil. Then um, the responses to UV stimuli were selectively boosted. 
And this um, fine pr prediction from the model, we have confirmed this using more simple stimuli and found also that this is a very consistent effect across mice. So here the question is, so what is the underlying mechanism of this shift in stimulus selectivity? And using pharmacological manipulations of the pupil, we were able to show that uh, this uh, shift is exclusively caused by a pupil dilation. So in an active state, the pupil dilates and this results in more light um, entering the eye, resulting in a dynamic shift from rod to cone for the receptor's vision, uh, extending their role beyond just uh, day and night vision. So what might this um, shift in stimulus selectivity, what might be the relevance of this for the animal's behavior? And to understand this, we have to understand the relevance of UV light in the visual world of mice. So from other environments like underwater, we know that the UV channel significantly improves the detection of objects, which can be picked up as dark silhouettes against a UV bright background. So I think we can agree if you're a fish and you would want to detect other potentially predatory fish, you would rather use the UV compared to the green channel to detect these other objects. And a similar effect is also present in the sky. So here you can see a movie uh, recorded at sunrise with our camera while mimicking an overhead predator uh, with a drone. And you can see that this drone is much better visible in the UV compared to the green channel. So a neuron that would boost its UV sensitivity during running periods when the animal is particularly prone for detection would um, facilitate the detection of this very important feature. And to test this hypothesis, we have um, presented the mouse with natural scenes that uh, with parametric stimuli inspired by these natural scenes, where we show an object either in the UV or green channel. And this revealed that the um, detection of the um, behaviorally relevant stimulus, which is the object in the UV channel here on the y-axis, significantly improves for behavioral periods with large pupil sizes when the animal is running. And so these results suggest that um, in contrast to um, other studies that have used like um, pupil dilation mainly as a readout of uh, behavior, uh, behavioral state or brain state, that the um, brain might actually use the pupil dilation with behavioral state to um, tune the visual system to specific um, features. And yes, yeah, so I have shown you um, in this talk that we in mice have a very detailed characterization of the um, retinal output and that we have recorded like, um, a, uh, like a library of natural scenes. And also that we have um, used more recently like an approach that allows us to study this visual processing in the context of the naturalistic input and also with respect to the animal's behavior. And so we, are currently further investigating how the brain processes the complex meshes from the eye by extending functional um, recordings to other brain areas, like for example, the superior colliculus, which is an evolutionary engine uh, brain area that is involved in distinct behaviors, like for, ex for example, escape response. And with this research, we hope to bring us a step closer in understanding how the um, early visual system processes the very complex message it receives from the eye to, in the end, allow such flexible behavior as can be seen in this movie. And with this, I would like to thank um, the students that have been involved um, in, the, um, in the work I presented and also my collaborators, the funding sources, and you for your attention. So I'm happy to take questions now. Thank you very much, Catherine. So, uh... We have time to take a few questions. Um, Santiago? Okay, that's uh, everyone else seems to be shy. Uh, I'll go for a brief general and perhaps a naive question. Forgive me for that. Uh, well, first of all, very nice talk, very interesting. Uh, I was wondering, uh, since the mice are mainly nocturnal animals, uh, how do you think that the pollution, I mean, how, how do you think that your, your experiments reflect the adaptations that, that those guys have been uh, through over evolution? And um, the question that is 
combines with the, the first one is whether uh, the recognition of shapes wouldn't be a better approach, uh, considering that at night, probably they don't see much colors. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, a, uh, an important question. So you always have to consider, um, so the mouse visual system is like broad dominant because they are um, active um, during darker periods, that's true. But also there are a lot of behavioral studies that show that mice adjust their behavioral periods depending on the food availability, for example. They are also very active during um, dusk and dawn periods and depending on the food, as I said, also during the day. And um, so I think that the, and so our estimations of how, when the cone photoreceptors get activated is actually relatively already when the sun is rising because the mouse eye, they can dilate their pupil and then um, you will already have mesopic vision. So I think the color vision or also the rods and cones will be active during these periods when mice are behaviorally active. And so I think that um, the color vision has like behavioral relevance. And um, also I think more, I mean, the idea that mice are not very visual animals, I think like research from the last um, maybe five years or so has really shown that this really depends on the, um, for example, behavioral task that you apply. And that there are a lot of behavioral behaviors when you use them that are relevant for mice, where they actually um, are very visual animals. Like for example, it has been found that they hunt crickets like very well uh, based only on their vision. And uh, so I think um, that we probably just have to rethink what is the ecological importance of the different behaviors and visual stimuli that we show. And um, yeah, I hope that addresses the question. Thank you very much. Yeah. Catherine, you have a question in the chat. I don't know if you can see it from uh, Olga. Yeah. So the question is, is there any yes. regulatory, not signal perce perceptive role for CGMP signal signaling in such a complex retinal processing? Yes. So uh, definitely, I mean, personally, I am not um, studying this, but um, so for example, um, I know that um, Thomas has a project with um, other people who um, actually image a CGMP. So they wanna see how this um, changes over um, like with light intensity. So your question is rather whether it has a modulator, more long-term modulatory role. And I'm pretty sure it has, but uh, I would have to look at the details, what is known about this. And so far we have not been studying this, but I'm sure that like um, a lot of, that there are a lot of modulatory effects, uh, short-term and more long-term also in the retina that we are currently, or most people are currently kind of ignoring in uh, what we do, yeah. Then you have uh, two more uh, questions in the Q&R panel. In the Q and A panel, yes. Yes. Okay. So the first question is whether we would have this highly developed channel specialization also in non-human primates, and so that's a very interesting question. And so in primates, um, morphologically, there have been like slightly over twenty different types identified. However, when you look at um, the fovea, which is um, in the fovea, there are mainly four different or maybe five different cell types. And in the end, um, I think most of the capacity in the brain in the end will deal with processing information that originates from the fovea. So the idea is that the peripheral retina in the primate might be more similar to mice and other species like zebra fish or chicken. However, the fovea is a very um, special case for primates or also birds. And in these, in the in primate fovea, you probably only have a few types. And there are some, there's this idea that maybe these types are then less specialized and more linear and simple. However, the nonlinear and more specialized computations are then performed in the brain. Yes, and the second question.
Yes, the second question is whether it's possible to modify the asymmetries you have in retina by an artificial environment in which the statistics is, for example, reversed. And so I think this is a very interesting um, question. So I um, think I know uh, there are studies that uh, look into this, but just uh, like dark wearing. So basically where the animals do not, um, are not exposed to any light during um, after, after birth. And there still you have the regional specialization um, where for example, you have the UV sensitivity uh, in the sky and the green sensitivity on the ground. But um, a lot of the more functional specializations, for example, color opponency and so on, this has not been studied um, using, for example, dark rearing be, uh, behavioral experiments, but that would be uh, very interesting. But a lot of these um, specializations, I would assume are more like um, hardwired, but uh, that's like very interesting to study. Thank you very much, Catherine. Yeah. So uh, to conclude this session, I would like to thank the speakers for their very nice and enlightening uh, talks. Thank you. And also the audience for the questions. So now we're going to have a coffee break and the next session will start at 1140.